Great. Well, welcome everybody to our Corgonian Science webinar. We're really delighted today to have Alex uh, Caberly speak with us. Uh, Alex actually grew up in Cobleskill, New York, he was just telling me. Uh, went to Cornell University for his undergraduate, um, got his master's in 2019 out at Oregon State University, where he worked on Chinook salmon, and then returned to Cornell, and well, he's now working with Suresh Sethi on Cisco restoration in New York Lakes in the Ontario Basin. So he's going to be speaking to us today about some telemetry work and some eDNA work, and we hope that you all will uh, hang around and have an interesting uh, conversation with us, questions afterwards. He's excited about the chance to share these uh, results to a broader uh, community. Um, one last plea before we um, sort of give the stage to Alex. Uh, we do not have any uh, talk scheduled for next month for our March webinar. So I've got a bunch of uh, sort of possibilities that people have talked about interest in the past. Um, we've had some speakers that signed up and then had to postpone because things have come up. So we're going to be reaching out, uh, or if you are on this call and have thought about, gosh, I'd really like to share my data, uh, uh, participate in this. You know, we have some openings over the next couple of months. So please reach out to me, reach out to Renee, um, so we can get you scheduled. Uh, this has been a really successful event and, um, but we don't have one to announce uh, for next month as of yet, but we will have one one way or the other, even if it's me having to sort of talk about stuff which you don't want. So, all right, Alex, uh, welcome. And we look forward to hearing your talk on Cisco restoration in Keuka Lake. Thank you, Bo. And uh, thanks for the introduction. And I'd just like to thank Bo, Renee, and uh, Nick for inviting me here today. Uh, I'm part of a a diverse group of collaborators across Cornell, as well as state and federal agencies. So I think I can speak on behalf of all of us that we're excited to share our work in the Finger Lakes region with the broader community in the Great Lakes. So today I'm going to talk about an ongoing Cisco restoration project, specifically in Cuca Lake, New York. And uh, just a quick outline for today's presentation, I'll provide some uh, background on this project. And then today I'll primarily focus on two different research areas. So the use of acoustic telemetry in Cuca Lake, as well as an environmental DNA project. I'll talk about some of the management implications for this work. And then lastly, I'll conclude with a few next steps for this project. And before I begin, I'd just like to acknowledge our collaborators again. Um, I started as a PhD student here at Cornell University in January of 2021, but this project has been an ongoing collaboration for a few years before I started. Um, specifically, uh, I'm funded by New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, um, and we work closely with the Region 8 uh, location in, in uh, the Western Finger Lakes region, uh, the Bath and Oneida Fish Hatcheries, and then we also collaborate with USGS Tunison. Um, the New York Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit, as well as uh, Fish and Wildlife Surf Service. So first, the goal for this project is to restore a locally extirpated population of native Cisco to improve the ecosystem integrity of Cuca Lake in New York. And I'll pose two research questions for today. First, what is the survival rate of acoustic tag juvenile Cisco? i.e. was were these stocking um, events successful? And second, through monitoring, what is their space use and distribution throughout Cuca Lake? And I know this audience is quite familiar with Cisco. Um, this background picture, I'm sure you've seen before, but Cisco have, um, have, historic, have declined from historic levels. This is a picture of a commercial catch from the um, Great Lakes, but just as a reminder, um, Cisco's were found throughout inland lakes like the Finger Lakes as well. So first, for folks that are unfamiliar with this area, where is Cuca Lake? So Cuca Lake um, is located in the Finger Lakes region of New York. It's the third largest Finger Lake. And as you can see on the map on the right, uh, here it's known as this distinctive Y-shaped lake. Um, I highlighted where I'm located in Ithaca with this red star. 
and Keuka Lake is considered an inland lake within the Lake Ontario Basin. Um, it's, it's typically classified as miso to oligotrophic, um, and it's also uh, an important agricultural region, so it's surrounded by mixed land use. This picture on the bottom left shows uh, um, one of the more popular agricultural industries here, which is viticulture, which is on the steep uh, shorelines of the lake. And throughout this presentation, I'll refer to each of these arms as the west arm, the east arm, the southern arm, as well as this bluff or the confluence region, which is just um, where these three arms converge. I'd also like to mention here, um, this picture is outside of Geneva, New York, which is on the, uh, the next Finger Lake over, which is Seneca Lake. And uh, the Finger Lakes, and specifically Geneva, um, is the self-proclaimed lake trout capital of the world. So I, I mentioned this because uh, lake, the lake trout fishery here throughout the Finger Lakes is very um, important and a very popular fishery for uh, local anglers. So with that, why, why Cisco in Cuca Lake? Um, so Cuca Lake is unique in that it contains the only self-sustained lake trout fishery in the Finger Lakes. Um, and in uh, 2017, the non-native alewife population um, was observed to collapse. Um, alewife had re replaced ciscos as the native um, prey base in Cuca Lake. And in conjunction with uh, a steady increase in water quality over time, this led New York State DEC to um, consider restoring a native Cisco population in Blake. Um, DEC has considered Cisco extirpated and this plot on the right side of your screen um, just illustrates uh, catch per unit effort with our historical um, lake wide surveys. And as, a, as you can see from when these uh, the survey data began in 1979, you see a pretty sharp decrease in catch per unit effort um, throughout the 1980s and the last uh, Cisco was netted in the early 1990s. So Cisco have since been declared extirpated um, since 1994 um, and have not been caught since. And just these numbers here are just the total number of Cisco caught in each of those surveys over time. So that leads me to the first part of, what, of the work that I'll share with you today which is using whole lake acoustic telemetry and time to event modeling to estimate juvenile Cisco survival. And uh, I realize folks here are probably familiar with acoustic telemetry, but for folks who might not be as familiar, just some quick background on what acoustic telemetry is and how we can use it. So um, telemetry is considered a method, is a method that um, can be used to characterize movement, behavior, uh, mortality or survival of animals. Acoustic telemetry in particular, um, there have been some modern advances that have really um, improved our uh, ability to track individual animals. Um, we've increased the transmission and coverage capabilities. And this is also, uh, as technology has increased, the costs for this have also decreased. So it's becoming more applicable across um, uh, broader scales. Uh, this diagram on the top, as you can see, this is just a schematic that I used from the Glotzos website, which is in the Great Lakes. Um, and the way that this works, just a quick summary, um, fish are uh, surgically implanted with an acoustic tag. And you can think of that tag as like a unique identifier or like a barcode. And that tag uh, transmits a, an acoustic signal or a ping. Um, you, have a, you can have a series of these acoustic receivers which are passive, so they're fixed at the bottom of the lake. Um, they've commonly been used in uh, river networks, dams, but in the lakes, um, you can arrange a grid of these receivers. And as a fish uh, swims through the listening range of this receiver, um, it will uh, that that the signal that is transmitted will be um, downloaded and stored as the including the, that with data that includes the tag as well as a timestamp of when that um, fish arrived or left the receiver. And this, um, so with this technology and with these decreased costs, we have some opportunities from a scientific standpoint. So um, as technology has increased and the tag performance has also increased, um, advances like these smaller acoustic tags really provide an opportunity for scientists and managers to advance our understanding of uh, a wider range of sizes and ages of uh, fishes. 
So now the methods that we applied for Cuca Lake, um, so we use these really small acoustic transmitters. These are um, JSATs technology, which were originally developed for uh, Columbia, Columbia River juvenile salmon, but we um, tagged fish with really small, so 0.3 and 0.6 gram tags, as well as three and a half gram tags. So uh, Cisco broodstock was collected from Chamont Bay in Lake Ontario. And then um, fish respond and reared um, in, at the USGS Tunison Lab in Cortland, New York. And uh, this project began in fall of 2018, where um, the first cohort of fish were stocked. And from fall of 2018 until fall of 2020, uh, we released a total of about 400,000 um, juvenile Cisco, and 272 of those were equipped with these small acoustic tags. I'd also like to mention. Um, that these uh, hatchery release fish, we released two age cohorts. So we released fish, age zero fish as fingerlings that were 10 months old. And then we also released uh, larger fish, so these age one yearlings that were either held at the hatchery for 18 or 22 months. Um, there was a, a tagging uh, sur uh, survival and um, tag retention study um, by our uh, collaborators from USGS. Um, if you have questions about some of the tag retention, retention findings, you, we can discuss this at the end, but I won't go into details here. Um, but we uh, found that um, typically these small tags uh, had high survival under a two and a half percent um, relative tag weight size. So these are the total number of stock fish um, throughout, throughout the duration of this project. So we, in total, we had five cohorts of fish that had acoustic, that fish that had acoustic tags um, beginning in fall 2018 through fall of 2020. That's the, the uh, yellow highlighted portion of this table. I'll mention it. I have a few quick notes here. Um, the first cohort of release fish in fall of 2018, we didn't have complete receiver coverage, but by the summer of 2019, we had a whole lake array. Unfortunately, in summer 2019, we had systematic ba battery failure across our receiver array. So for future analyses, um, I excluded that summer 2019 cohort. And um, in total, again, we uh, stocked about 400,000 fish through 2020 um, for a total of 272 acoustic transmitters. And again, um, that includes two age cohorts at release. And um, we DEC is still stocking Cisco. so. In the past two falls, um, about 30,000 fish per year have been stocked as fingerlings. So now uh, I'll talk about our acoustic array. So this um, figure on the right shows our whole lake receiver coverage. So um, starting in uh, 2019 and onward, we deployed 20 total receivers, and those varied from 16 meter to 57 meter depths throughout the lake. Um, we did conduct distance trials, and if you have questions, I can um, take those at the end about the distance trials that we found on average about a 200 to 300 meter diameter linear range um, for tag efficiency. And uh, Cuca Lake, um, the outlet is in the northeastern corner, and there's um, actually a, uh, it connects to the next finger lake, which is Seneca Lake. So to meet our assumption for a closed population, we did station receivers in the outlet as well as the um, mouth in Seneca Lake. And I'll just mention that we did not um, detect any tagged fish uh, outside of Cuca Lake. Um, and then we placed these low-tech receivers. They were fixed at the bottom of the lake. They're about one meter from the bottom and angled upward in the water column. Um, and as you can see, we had receivers throughout the lake, but Approximately midway in each arm, we station like a gate of three receivers to try to increase our coverage for detecting uh, moving Cisco's. And across all years, this, this red star shows our stocking site. So all cohorts were stocked offshore of the state park in the northwestern arm. So next, uh, I'll talk about our modeling approach. So for the following analyses, we use time to event models. Um, so acoustic telemetry, uh, particularly by meeting a closed population assumption with our whole lake coverage, there's some real utility here for modeling survival um, because we can track the entire lifespan of an individual as well as when they die. 
And time to event models, you can think of these as the probability of an individual surviving to a uh, specific time. And if we look at this, the figure on the right, um, on the x-axis, you have time. On the y-axis, you have uh, individuals. These types of models have been commonly used in the medical sciences. So you can use a time to event model to estimate um, mortality from a disease or perhaps uh, a drug treatment. You can measure if a patient recovered or died. Um, but here in fisheries, by having these individually tracked animals, um, we can essentially make an assumption that we know the fate of the individual subject. And these models are also robust because there are occasions where we might not know when an animal died. And these models are flexible in that they can also account for censored observations. So if a fish um, goes undetected um, and we don't know if, it, if it's dead, uh, we can also censor or remove those individuals from our, um, our, um, uh, our survival model. So just a few uh, notes on our detection histories and um, assumptions. So I used a, a combination of filtering scripts as well as some built-in functions in the GLaDOS package, which is really helpful. And then we also manually inspected all of our detection histories for the tagged fish. And just a few notes on assumptions here. So um, if a, a transmitter was cons uh, had a constant detection, so essentially if a transmitter was sitting at the bottom of the lake and we had a constant detection um, for a, a long period of time at a single receiver, um, we assume that that fish died. Uh, we also make the assumption that if a fish goes undetected with our coverage that um, experienced a mortality event and then I did calculate um, the average detection individual, the, the average interval um, between our detections for individual fish. And we found generally on average, um, about a, uh, on average for an individual, uh, a fish that was detected was detected about every two days on average. Um, so generally, we found that if a fish was detected on the array, that we didn't really see um, considerable time gaps between when it was detected. Uh, we also treat um, fish that were undetected immediately at stocking as a straight to death event. And then lastly, um, the literature on this really varies, as I'm sure folks here are familiar with. But in the event of predation, um, we think that the tag was expelled relatively quickly for these models. And I know the literature varies on this a lot, um, particularly with uh, lake trout and salmon, um, and that in the literature is shown with acoustic transmitters to vary from you know days to weeks um in our case we did use uh these smaller tags um but again the literature on this does vary and lastly i meant i mentioned the the censoring capability of time to event models so in the case of tagged fish um there's a finite limit to these batteries so for these small tags the maximum uh, battery expectancy under a conservative estimate we calculated to be about 100 days. In contrast, those larger three gram three gram tags um, would last about uh, just over a thousand days. So, if a fish survived up until that um, expected battery lifespan, we could treat that individual as a censored observation. So it could be removed from the study, but we can't infer if it was still alive or if it died due to the battery. And this plot on the bottom is just an individual detection plot. Um, this is just an example. So this particular particular individual we tracked um, on the x-axis is time, and the y-axis are receiver sites. As you can see from when it was stocked, it moved um, among a few different receivers from north to south, and then uh, over time um, was, was detected again across uh, multiple receivers and then went undetected um, after about a month from when it was stocked. So now I'd like to share some of the survival results. So these plots are known as Kaplan-Meier um, survival curves, and I'll talk everyone through how these work. Um, so just including the cohorts again from fall 2019 to summer 2020. On these plots, on the x-axis, you can see time, and you can think of this as time from when the fish was originally stocked. And on the y-axis, you have the survival rate. And because this is a probability, um, that just goes from zero to one. So over time, you'll notice the general pattern is the survival decreases and eventually um, uh, 
goes towards zero. So when no fish were still still alive. Um, and I color coded these plots. So the, the orangish lines are associated to the age zero or the fingerling releases and the blue line lines are for the um, larger uh, age one fish. And in, right away, you can see um, a couple uh, a couple patterns. Um, we notice significantly higher uh, mortality, particularly at release with the small age zero fish and um, longer term survival with the uh, yearling fish. So just a few quick summary stats for the, the age zero fish. The average survival um, for both fall release cohorts was about six days across all release tagged fish. And none of the fingerlings were tracked in our array um, past 152 days. So we didn't observe any um, think fall fingerling fish to survive through the following winter or greater than about six months time. In contrast, those age one fish, um, the average survival for with both cohorts ranged from about 50 to 68 days. And we did observe um, one individual fish surviving to 405 days, which is the longest time that we had detected uh, tagged fish on our array. And if we look at the um, that summer 2020 cohort, uh, of stocked yearlings, that would um, give us a survival estimate of about 1.2% sur annual survival for those um, age, one, age one fish. And just to go back to that fall 2018 cohort, so I was able to just do kind of a quick um, uh, survival analysis for this cohort. And again, this was an incomplete, uh, this is when we had incomplete receiver coverage. So on the right, you just see a plot of the number of um, detection events. So not individual detections, but um, collapsing detections into just events of when fish were on a receiver. And you'll see that we had fish that were detected across all of all six receivers that were initially deployed. However, some of those fish did go to the Southern um, receivers. So we don't have this closed population assumption of we don't know if fish left the array and died or returned. And um, if you just run a couple of simple Cormac Jolly Seber models, um, here I estimated apparent survival, and I, I can do that by accounting for both survival as well as the detection probability at these receiver sites. And what we see is um, similar to the time to event models for those fall fingerling fish. Um, low initial survival, but also um, none of those fish survived past uh, mid-November of after, so about a month after release. And none of those fall fish were detected on our array once we had whole lake receiver coverage in December. So again, low survival rates with these fall 2018 fish um, that we infer even with the partial receiver coverage. So next, um, I, I, uh, we were interested in looking at some uh, potential covariate effects um, with these different cohorts of stock fish. So we used um, Cox proportional hazard models, which are an extension of those Kaplan-Meier curves that I show you. And the way that these work is they relate um, survival rates to a baseline hazard, and they also can account for different covariates. So I, we constructed a model set of 16 total models, and we included um, covariates like year, age, uh, size metrics, as well as um, an interaction term where we have size uh, given a particular age. So because size and age are confounded, we couldn't include uh, length and age in the same model because older fish are um, larger. And then we used an AIC framework for model selection. And um, this is just uh, part of our, our constructed model set. But what you can see is um, if you go by the, you know, the two Delta AICC, the, the two top competing models um, include just a single covariate for age. And then also the um, next highest rank model was a year plus age effect. And um, in kind of the looking across the model set, um, about 70% of the total support by AIC weight included uh, an age term. Um, as well as uh, size and age, although there's less um, support for that. And again, um, it's size given age because size and age are confounded. And if we go ahead and plot these, um, what we see is a really clear pattern. So our uh, top proportional hazards model, so this is predicted survival by the um, 
uh, covariate age. And we can see a real clear pattern. These age one uh, older fish have uh, much higher survival initially and long-term compared to these uh, fingerling fish. And if we do include a, um, an, another term for, for year, so a year effect, um, we still see this clear pattern, um, slight variation uh, in uh, each year, but um, pretty clear pattern of this uh, age effect. So our, our key take home with these survival curves is that older, so those age one fish uh, stocked Cisco have much higher survival rates than the younger uh, fingerling Cisco. And we can unpack these survival curves in a little more detail. And the utility of, of these time to event models is we can start to pick apart um, survival rates and look at uh, finer scale temporal variation that might not be as easily um, interpreted from, uh, say, a, um, a parametric, like an exponential survival curve. And what we see with these time to event models um, are uh, this is the top uh, proportional hazards model. So the predicted survival um, by age. And um, the, uh, those age zero or fingerling fish, so these are fish that were stocked at 10 months, have uh, really high initial mortality. So that those straight to death fish, fish that were um, either undetected at stocking or um, detected just for the first few hours after stocking, it, is, a, is about 75%. So 75% of those fingerlings um, have uh, experienced death at stocking. In contrast, those age one fish um, had about 30% initial mortality. So the, the age one fish had higher initial survival. But interestingly, um, while this looks uh, perhaps uh, not great for long-term Cisco survival in, in CUCA, these larger fish, we noticed that these survival curves sort of flatten out. Um, I forgot to mention this in the Kaplan-Meier curves, but these are uh, non-parametric, so there's no statistical distribution. And these long horizontal periods are when an individual um, is alive, and then you have these steep vertical drops in the curve when um, an individual experiences death. And if you look at this the survival curve, for the age one fish in particular, we see that this curve sort of flattens out or kind of tails off over time. So this perhaps suggests that there are a few of these age one fish at release that can um, have longer term survival where perhaps they're entering a more natural mortality regime um, and uh, perhaps can um, re potentially reach the next year class, although there are you know, here, uh, two observations. Um, so that initial, back to the initial mortality question, uh, we suspect that a lot of that initial mortality um, was a function of a few different factors, um, but we think that there's really heavy predation, particularly from lake trout and birds. Um, it's likely a combination of, of you know, physiological stress, um, predation, maybe uh, inability to adapt to environmental conditions, but uh, we think that there's probably a, a high predation gauntlet at stocking, and that's confirmed by a, a few observations. Um, we did have uh, this example here of an angler who caught this lake trout, I believe, yeah, two days after the fall 2020 stocking, and uh, the lake trout had over 20 uh, juvenile cisco in its stomach. So what are the management implications from these results? Um, if uh, this paper in CJFAS was published just at the end of last year, and the title is Benefits of Stocking Fewer but Larger Individuals. Um, and I just pulled two graphs from this uh, paper. The, the graph on the left just shows a pretty clear relationship um, with uh, as size increases at stocking, you have uh, higher survival rates. And then they also um, conducted a cost benefit analysis. And interestingly, what they found here, and this is in the Southwest with a species of sucker, um, that given the same cost for uh, rearing these fish, um, the net benefit of uh, investing that money into these age two fish versus the age one fish had a much higher um, uh, increase in the number of new spawners produced. So for the same cost, but maybe, um, uh, fewer but larger fish, 
um, you'd actually have more net spawners produced, which in turn um, has broader implications for restoration in terms of increasing the, the contributors to a, um, a viable population. So back to Cuca Lake, um, that paper I think uh, was interesting to see because I would argue that our results um, do show that there is clearly this pattern of um, larger fish have a uh, higher survival. But I'd also like to acknowledge that, especially with Cisco, as folks here are aware, um, there are uh, trade-offs to this. So in a hatchery setting, you know, growing fish larger requires holding Cisco much longer. Um, and you know, the, the space requirements, the staff, the personnel requirements are um, still quite intensive. So from a management perspective, um, we uh, these results we've had discussions about perhaps exploring some alternative stocking practices. So with those larger fish, where we saw a few individuals surviving to longer periods, if there's something we could operate on at stocking to try to increase the number of individuals to perhaps give them a chance for longer survival, um, we've discussed a few uh, management strategies. Um, perhaps something like net pens, where if we can't hold those fish in the hatchery for longer, perhaps they could be um, uh, reared in a net pen environment in the lake to try to give those fish a chance to acclimate to um, environmental conditions. Um, we, as I mentioned, all these fish were stocked at the same site and logistically there's reasons for that, but we've discussed perhaps exploring multiple release sites. So it's not this huge predation gauntlet um, at the stocking site. And then I have talked to some other folks in the Great Lakes. Um, and so these have been some other ideas that I've heard, but um, testing uh, shoreline stocking or nighttime stocking, and also considering the timing of release. So trying to match fish with environmental conditions um, when food might be perhaps, there might be more food availability um, later in the summer as opposed to in the fall, particularly for these young fish. I'll also just mention quickly that um, New York State DEC has been uh, working on Cisco rearing uh, uh, facilities in the um, Bath Hatchery in uh, just south of Cuca Lake in New York, and um, Bath will have capabilities to continue stocking Cisco's in uh, Cuca. So next, I'd like to transition and uh, share some of our um, findings from an eDNA study that that was conducted. So uh, the second part of my presentation, I'll discuss uh, use of environmental DNA to determine space use of uh, stock Cisco and Cuco Lake. So uh, why eDNA in an inland lake? So um, I've shared with you that our results from this acoustic telemetry work and from a, a management and monitoring perspective, there is kind of this trade-off. So acoustic telemetry equipment is fairly um, intensive to both implement and monitor it. There's equipment costs, there's tagging costs, and just the um, personnel and work and effort required to uh, you know, collect and download these receivers and service them is quite intensive. So uh, a tool like eDNA potentially could be useful for these species that are um, rare or uh, perhaps um, in low densities to be able to detect if that species is present or not. So eDNA has commonly been studied in stream and river settings, but in lakes, this presents a whole new, um, a bunch of new challenges. So lakes um, have complex currents. Uh, lakes like in the Finger Lakes go through stratification. So you have different um, layers that make using eDNA um, potentially difficult to uh, detect species like Cisco. So this study, um, with the Cisco reintroduction in Cuca, this provides us an opportunity to test eDNA in a lake that's still deep, um, but a much smaller surface area than the Great Lakes. So we can evaluate um, the uh, our um, sampling efficiency for a deep water species like Cisco. So um, this study, the fieldwork was conducted before I arrived at Cornell. So um, all the fieldwork, uh, I'd just like to thank um, uh, so many different folks, but uh, uh, folks from, our, from DEC, USGS, Cornell, as well as a really active uh, lake association. There are several um, local residents who uh, offered their dock space to help with this survey. So um, we collected eDNA 
on two sampling occasions. So the first sampling occasion was in July of 2020, where we'd expect to have a low Cisco density. And then again in October 2020, which was just after our fall stocking, so we'd expect a much higher density of Cisco. And in total, the whole lake was canvassed, so 56 sites were sampled at two different depths, 12 meters, which is about the middle of the thermocline, and 18 meters, which is the bottom of the thermocline. And what did we find? Um, so the lab work was, uh, this lab work was conducted by Fish and Wildlife Service, the Northeast Fishery Center in Pennsylvania. Um, they developed two new PCR markers for Cisco. And um, uh, what they found was that no, none of the July samples contain, uh, had positive eDNA detections. However, the fall or the October 2020 sample our 2020 survey, um, nine out of 117 samples had amplified DNA. And of those nine samples that had positive detections, um, five were at the 12 meter depth and four samples were at the 18 meter depth. So about a 50-50 um, uh, positive detections at 12 or 18 meters. Um, and they did conduct a sensitivity analysis and um, the uh, samples that amplified were, were generally the amount of eDNA was quite low, um, and we suspect that's likely due to um, probably low abundances of Cisco. So we can't really make inferences on abundance from uh, the amount of DNA itself. So I would just like to revisit our acoustic telemetry array, and we can um, use our survival estimates through uh, acoustic telemetry to estimate, well, how many Cisco are in the lake at any given moment? Um, this is just a really simple equation, but um, we can estimate abundance by just multiplying those time-specific survival rates from our time to event models by the number of fish that were stocked at in each cohort. So for example, that July sampling occasion, um, none of the tagged fish that were released in fall of 2019 were still tracked on the array. So they um, likely died. Uh, I think at the latest was was in June. So none of those fall 2019 fish were still alive for the July survey. However, um, we did stock 200 total age one fish uh, about two weeks prior to the July sampling event. So if we uh, do the calculation, we'd estimate that um, 149 age one fish were at large in Cuca during the July sampling event. Um, so that would be a, a low fish density. In contrast, for the October eDNA sampling, um, this was two weeks after, about 10 or 10 days after the fall stocking. This would be a much higher fish density. And if we just multiply the, num the survival estimate by the number of uh, total fish that were stocked, so 200,000 fish, um, we'd estimate uh, about 18,000 uh, Cisco were still at large for the October sampling event. So, where are the Cisco? These this is uh, for the, the summer eDNA period. And just as a reminder, um, we estimated that there were still about 150 yearlings uh, that had survived when we canvassed the lake in July. If we just plot the number of tagged fish, we can just spatially get a visualization of where those fish were on the array. And we can see that if you just look at the total number of fish detected from when they were stocked to when the eDNA survey was conducted, we see that we, we detected tagged fish primarily in this west arm with a few detections um, in the, uh, the east branch. And then if we just zoom in on the number of fish that the tagged fish that were detected on the July occasion, we had positive detections, uh, acoustic detections um, around that stocking site again. So back to this uh, northwestern corner and we had a few detections um, midway on the, in the gate site on the east arm. Um, we did not detect eDNA on July 21st. And again, just recall, um, this would be an expected low density period. So perhaps um, not since the eDNA was not um, able to detect fish at a uh, really low density, like in July. But if we look at the eDNA results from the fall, on the left, these are where, these are the, um, these are the ED, this is the eDNA survey. So these blue points are where we did not detect eDNA, and these yellow points are the positive eDNA detections. On the right, um, I just plotted the total number of detection events. So again, the collapsed um, detections. 
from the day of stocking on October 15th up until the, um, the eDNA survey on the 27th. And these would be a few individual yearlings, but primarily at this point on um, fingerling fish that were stocked. And if we zoom in, um, we see that most of those eDNA detections occurred in the northwestern arm of the lake, so near the stocking site, as well as um, a, a few eDNA detections around the bluff and just south of the bluff. Um, and we think of this as kind of the confluence area of the lake. In contrast, on our acoustic telemetry array, we see that we had det fish detected uh, primarily in this west arm. So we had detections throughout the northwestern um, part of the lake, as well as just north of the bluff, but in the west arm. And what's interesting is we noted, we observed this spatial mismatch um, right around the confluence. So we did not have any acoustic tag detections south of the bluff, um, as well as no detections at the bluff. And we think that there might be a few drivers of this. The first obvious one is that we only had one acoustic receiver positioned at the bluff. This is the widest part of the lake, so it's about three kilometers wide. So our receiver coverage was sparse at the bluff. Um, in contrast, the eDNA detections, we had you know, essentially four detections at the confluence. Um, but we also think that there might be more going on here in a lake um, with currents. So we know that currents in lakes have the potential to transport particles. Um, and perhaps this area is kind of a suspected mixing area. And um, we, so we thought uh, perhaps there's more going on with eDNA transport via currents. So uh, I'll transition to some next steps. And I foreshadowed, um, we actually conducted a field experiment this fall to try to quantify these currents in Cuca Lake. Um, so these uh, devices are called Lagrangian drifters. And I just like to acknowledge uh, Lou McCaffrey with DEC and Lemoyne College. Uh, Lou had de developed these low cost uh, drifters and had deployed them in Seneca Lake to empirically measure currents. And uh, we, I spoke to him this summer and told him about the eDNA work. And we thought, what a, what a um, potentially uh, useful application of these drifters to think about um, water movement and how that could uh, uh, map out with our eDNA detections. Um, so we conducted this field survey this fall for two weeks. Um, these drifters are uh, built with hardware that you could find at your uh, local hardware store and they contain a GPS unit. And the way that these work are these um, large plastic sheets. Um, they're uh, about four feet tall and they have a really high drag coefficient and they're attached to a tether um, to a float at the surface that uh, has a low drag coefficient. So the idea is that the, the whatever is operating at, um, at depth is what is um, driving these moving these drifters and inside the float is a GPS unit so we can spatially collect points um, as these drifters are moving throughout the lake. And we um, deployed six drifters throughout Cuca Lake for two and a half weeks this fall and um, tracked them across the lake and they were set at the sampling depths for eDNA. So we, we uh, tried to um, track currents at that 12 meter and 18 meter sampling depths. I'm not going to share any data today. Um, we're still working through the results, but just uh, offhand, they moved much more than we expected. So um, future directions, uh, we need to um, uh, still validate those drifter paths and um, overlay some of our uh, spatial um, uh, data from the telemetry and eDNA. But the um, initial, the initial uh, project uh, was quite successful, and we're excited to map this out and see how this might. Um, how these currents might look relative to the eDNA survey. Also as a next step, so um, the, the later stages of my PhD dissertation, I'll be working on developing a food web model for Cuca Lake. Um, we've discussed using EcoPath or uh, linear inverse modeling to uh, construct a food web model for the lake. And the idea is um, to simulate a, a restored Cisco population scenarios over time. I'll also mention that Cuca Lake, um, we have additional data sources, which I um, am beginning to look into, but um, we've been collecting monthly zooplankton 
conducting monthly zooplankton surveys since the start of this project. Um, the Cuca Lake Association has a long-term uh, water chemistry database that goes back to um, the early 1990s. And then we also have um, a statewide fish survey database. So every three years, um, DEC conducts uh, lake trout and a um, forage assessment for Cuca Lake. And then we'd also um, would consider borrowing some population metrics from, say, Lake Ontario or other comparable inland lakes. And yeah, we're, we are open to your ideas for this. And then lastly, um, as I mentioned, uh, DEC conducts a lake-wide uh, lake trout and forage fish assessment um, every three, year, three years. So this year was uh, the year for Cuca Lake. And on July 22nd, we netted a uh, Cisco in our lake trout survey. Um, this was in the, the southern arm of Cuca Lake. It was uh, in a bottom gill net uh, that was targeting uh, lake trout. Um, and uh, yeah, we were pleasantly pleasantly surprised to catch this Cisco. And uh, it was about 220 millimeters in length. And um, we have the, uh, the um, otoliths and scales and we're still uh, processing those. So stay tuned, but um, we think it's uh, probably over a year old, but um, stay tuned for a final assessment. Yeah, and with that, um, I'll I'm happy to take any questions. And uh, I just like to acknowledge and a huge thanks to all of these um, collaborators from Fish and Wildlife Service and USGS to DEC, uh, Cornell, um, as well as various lab groups at Cornell. Um, and uh, thank you for the um, the webinar series for hosting us. Thanks, Alex. That was great. Um, really interesting data there, especially showing that higher survival of the larger reintroduced fish, um, the eDNA, and uh, all of the nuances there, trying to interpret those data. Um, really needs to see those data as well. Um, I just might ask a simple question to start off with. Um, what was the primary cause of their extirpation from Kiuka? Yeah, so we think it's um, <clears throat> probably a combination of competition from uh, alewife. Um, Alewife had re replaced Cisco for the um, prey base in Cuca. And then uh, Cuca Lake also had um, degraded water quality. So by the 90s, there was a lot of uh, nutrient inputs. Um, and uh, I think in the early 2000s, the Lake Association and some of the um, county municipalities have made some improvements to the way that um, sewage and runoff was treated. So we think the water quality has increased since the early 2000s. Um, but again, there there wasn't uh, necessarily like a commercial fishery for mm -hmm. Cisco, um, at least in Cuca Lake. So likely um, non-native smelt, alewife, and then uh, degraded water quality. So smelt are there too? Smelt are there, yes. Okay. Um, and the water quality, was that just uh, like, I mean, like Minnesota lakes, it's really well studied knowing sort of that range of thermal squeeze where they can find oxygenated water in, in the right thermal habitat. Is that, could that have been the issue? Or is there, when you talk about sort of water quality, do you know exactly what that mechanism may have been? I don't offhand. And that's something that I'll be digging into um, with that, uh, the Lake Association, the water chemistry database that we have. Um, I'm beginning to go through that now. So I would be curious to look into that and explore that too. Yeah. And there's a lot of uh, definite analogies here to other systems, including the Great Lakes. I saw that Titus had a good question about sort of the, how stocking can vary. Uh, or where you stock and how what strategies might affect survival of stockfish. And he asked, has anyone tried stocking Cisco into temporary net pens? Um, you know, it's just an interesting idea, holding them, allowing them to can sort of condition the new, uh, new environment and then release them at night or offshore. Do you want to address that, Alex? Yeah, we... Um... This has been an active discussion. Um, we have not tried net pens yet. Um, I, uh, yeah, I'm not aware of any study that is, uh, has tested net pens for Cisco. I mean, I know that they've been used for salmonids. Um, 
one of the challenges with that in Cuca Lake is this lake gets a quite heavy boat traffic throughout the summer. Um, so, you know, putting a net pen out in August or probably before Labor Day might present um, significant challenges. But um, I'd also mention that we, um, the Lake Association has been very active and supportive of this project. And, you know, we might have, a, there might be some opportunities to work with um, local residents to, in the future, test uh, something like this. And um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, you might not be able to have a net pen out over the summer, but you could potentially um, test, you know, with the acoustic telemetry array and some tags, um, you know, if even holding them for a few, week, few weeks uh, into, you know, maybe you could put them out after Labor Day in a net pen when the boat traffic decreases. Um, and then in terms of the other part of the question, we have not yet tested um, uh, different release sites or, or nighttime stocking, but I've, I've heard uh, that come up um, in Lake Ontario. So yeah, I can't comment if, if, um, but it's something that we've considered in the future. And if other folks have, are more familiar with this or have tested this, feel free to jump in. Yeah, we would love to hear your feedback. Yeah, I was, I'm aware of a proposal that was just funded in Lake Ontario to explore net pins. And I was looking to see if Dimitri or Matt Altenritter or Ryan Weidel was on the webinar. There might be some other PIs that are on the webinar. I know they're actively thinking about how to design it, sort of the, so the challenges you talked about, how to control for the potentially rough conditions, how to control for boating, the permitting that goes associated with that. Um, is anybody on the webinar that might be able to speak to some of those plans for Corrigoni net pens in, in Lake Ontario? Renee, you might have to help me see people raise hands. Um, so while we sort of let that out there, we do have a question from Colin Bean asking about the eDNA. I think you can probably read it there yourself. Do you think some of those eDNA detections in the bluff area, that confluence could be attributed to the transfer of DNA by other species, sort of through predation, pooping out the, the DNA? Um, are, are there cormorants in that area? Um, so, and then he has a second question about sort of the, I think the tag burden. So the size, but I think he means there's the size of the transmitter relative to the total weight of the fish, if you were within sort of the guidelines or not. Yes. So the first part of your question, I'm glad you asked that. Um, yeah, that is, that's a really interesting consideration. I mean, we do suspect there's high predation from lake trout. Um, I mean, it, it, I'd say that, yeah, I mean, the, there it's, there's likely there could be transport from, uh, predated fish. Um, but I, yeah, I couldn't, you know, uh, separate that out, um, from the data, but the question about birds, um, we did anecdotally observe, uh, heavy bird predation when they, during those daytime stocking events. Um, interestingly, there was one acoustic tag that I picked up on the receiver in the West arm. And then a day later, it was actually detected on a receiver site um, on the northeasternmost arm, which really did not have many detections. Um, and that time of year, I think it was, uh, uh, I think it was later in the season. So I'm not a bird person, um, but uh, waterfowl in the Finger Lakes, particularly later in the fall, can be um, quite prevalent. And yeah, there are cormorants, uh, osprey eagles, uh, mergansers. So, I mean, I'm speculating here, but, um, you don't think it swam that far on its own? It, it's possible. We did not, we yeah. did not notice of the tagged fish, um, tagged fish missing, like, you know, considerable number of receivers, the fish that had moved were, um, typically detected across multiple receiver receivers, but that, uh, it's possible, but that was one, one, uh, one interpretation of that data. Um, yeah, Jim, the, kind of, you see Jim's question there about the detection probability. Yeah, I did like a back of the envelope calculation on this. So, um, the, our, our, uh, the, with a two to 300 meter linear 
diameter. Um, we could estimate that if you just look at the total surface area of the lake, um, we had about one and a half to just over 3% coverage at any given moment um, of the lake. Again, that would be like kind of a uh, assumption that that's uniform. Um, and we know that there are likely parts of the lake that um, Cisco are not using, like that northeastern corner. Um, we did have a few detections there, but that's fairly shallow habitat near Penyan, which is a um, small town. Um, so yeah, at any given moment, um, I think we could we could probably dig into that in more detail. Um, but again, I mean, this is a, a highly a, a species that moves a lot, so we kind of assume that through movement, um, we have coverage to pick them up on the array. But the probability of a fish dying and the tag not being deposited directly on a receiver um, uh, is, is still considerably high. And then the question on the age zero fish, uh, Jim is on the call here, so he might be able to clarify this more, but I did include a slide here. So this is a plot from the um, this acoustic tag retention and the um, tagging mortality study from uh, that Tunison conducted. Um, and generally, this this is predicted survival. Um, so survival to 30 days and tag retention. And the study found uh, greater than 95% survival and tag ret retention for that relative tag weight of less than 2.5%. Um, and, and I believe they used both the 0.3 and the 0.6 gram tags in this study. Um, and then... Uh, in uh, for the actual the, te the telemetry portion of this, any released fish were held on site for at least two weeks and monitored before they were stocked in the lake. Yeah, Alex, that this is Jim. Yeah, that that that's correct. Um, what I don't recall, and Mark can probably answer this, is what size fish we were actually using to you know so that we could determine that proportion, but. I was thinking it was five percent or less. Mark, do you do you recall? Yes, Jim, that's correct. Okay. Um, I'll we wait to see if other questions pop up. Notice Renee did put in the chat if you wanted to go ahead and register for the webinar for next month. Um, even though you don't know the topic yet, we're sure it'll be enticing. Uh, you can go ahead and click that link to register. Um, so, so Alex, thinking about sort of the differential survival from the yearlings to the fingerlings, pretty compelling data. Is that is that changing sort of the reintroduction strategy going forward? Is the is the capacity at the DEC hatchery there to sort of put the effort into holding them longer, even if they're releasing fewer? Do you know if that's really, if that's been sort of translated into sort of changes yet? Yeah, I mean, we, um, I can't speak on behalf of DEC, but I know we've, I mean, this has been, it's, this is part of a, um, a longer term reintroduction program. So I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Brad, I, I think that they have an, another, you know, five plus years um, Plan for stocking. So it's always good to find this out early on uh, in this reintroduction program. Um, the uh, bath hatchery facilities, I believe they're in the process of building those facilities to be able to um, rear fish now. Um, but uh, primarily we've really discussed um, trying to uh, maybe test some different practices at stocking. Um, yeah, it, it certainly, there's a space requirement for holding those fish longer um, that can be challenging. So, and with with the acoustic telemetry equipment too, I think there would um, be a nice opportunity to have, you know, additional tagged fish that you could <clears throat> actually conduct an experiment and release fish from a net pen versus directly from the hatchery and examine if there are um, mm -hmm. differences or no differences in survival. And yeah, if uh, anyone, Brad or anyone else from DEC would like to jump on and answer that too, feel free to uh, speak up. This is Webb Pearsall with DEC. Um, everything is open for a discussion now. Um, it was definitely 
eye opening to, to see the uh, the results. Um, Bath is uh, the new hatchery is being built uh, in order to uh, raise up to a hundred thousand um, Cisco, but they're also going through management changes along as you know along the region. But um, we have just talked to them met about two weeks ago and brought up the idea of maybe raising larger but fewer um, fish. And one is space, the other is just water supply. Uh, they also raise uh, trout and lake trout and rainbow trout at that hatchery. So um, they, you know, they're going to be looking into it and we'll be uh, definitely talking about that. It's an intriguing idea from a management point of view, uh, but you know, we kind of have to defer to production on what really can be done uh, safely and efficiently. So uh, we are definitely talking about that. Also looking at possible pen sites uh, along docks or shallow water. Um, as Alex said, it, it's a heavy used lake. So um, midwater pens, I don't think would be uh, appropriate. So at this point. That's great. Thanks for jumping on there, providing that context. Um, anybody else from DEC? So Alex, another uh, question in here. Let's, Katie gave you two. Let's jump to that second one because it relates kind of the stocking. Um, she's asking, were the age were the age ones that survive better stocked in a different time of year than the age zero stocked in October? And so thinking about could there be other things beyond just size itself that could sort of confer higher survival in terms of timing of stocking, in terms of yeah. time, like yeah. Yeah, it's a uh, great question. Um so the age one, age one plus. So we had fish that were stocked in uh june and july and then we did have a cohort of fish that were held into october um and um we did in our within our kind of two competing top models um there was a year a year covariate so uh there probably is a year uh some <clears throat> annual variation but it's Statistically, it's I thought about this. It's it's difficult to separate those because the age cohort year is confounded. We didn't have like two um same year age one releases with some that were released in the summer and some that were released in the fall. Um unfortunately, the the year that that we did, um, we had that battery failure across our array. Um, so those summer fish in June of 2019, um, we were not able to track them throughout the summer. Um, but I can say that those fish, I think there were like 22 fish that were released. We did have some that were uh, detected when we had batteries again later in the fall, um, but it was a lower sample size. So the um, that summer cohort of 2020 um, did have uh, the highest initial survival rate um, as well as had the individual that had survived into the following summer for greater than a year. Um, but in terms of statistically separating the conditions, I think would be uh, challenging with the data, but something certainly that I could look into. And her other question just asked you to speak a little bit more about the historical abundance of Cisco sort of prior to their collapse. Um, were they before alewife, before smelt, were they the predominant forage species in the lake and and their decline has it been sort of long time coming or was it pretty abrupt I guess yeah I um they were historically the um the main forage fish um throughout the Finger Lakes um and uh in Cuca Lake yeah the uh I don't know um our statewide database goes back to like 1979 so I don't have data um before that and I so I can't really comment uh before um and Webb and Brad feel free to clarify that um but yeah I don't I don't really have uh, an estimate for historical abundances other than they were the primary forage fish yeah. That answers my question. Thank you. Okay. 
So Alex, I see a lot of analogies between, or some analogies potentially to what has been going on in Lake Huron, stocking Cisco, um, maybe five years now. Um, I don't know if anybody from Lake Huron is on this call that might speak to sort of the more recent data with regard to getting some adults to return back to the Bay um, from initial stocking two, three, four years ago, or probably more like three or four years ago. Um, and so for, before I say something that may be incorrect, is anybody on the call from Fish and Wildlife or Michigan DNR that might be able to speak to some of the more recent results for the Lake Huron, Saginaw Bay survival? And what I'm thinking about is they had both spring stocked fish and fall stocked fish. And um, I think, and they had them marked differentially so they can tell which ones at least are returning at a higher rate three, four, five years later. I'm not sure the exact time. Um, and I think I understand it that it's actually the, the ones that are um, stocked in the spring that are smaller rather than the ones that are stocked in the fall that are larger that had the higher return rate. But I, I'm not, that's like a 90% certainty about that. So is anybody on the call that could speak to sort of this potential size affecting size of stockfish affecting survival from the Lake Huron data that's relatively hot off the press? So if not, I can I can try to put you in contact, Alex, yeah. some of those people that have gotten some of that information from. Yeah, that would be see. great. Do you know like when, what time during the spring they would release this? June, June? May, okay. June. So it's kind of a loose spring, I would say. And those are like young of year fish? Yeah, I think those were like, those would have been essentially, um, those were the ones that were collected up from Northern Lake Huron the year before, incubated in the hatcheries. Okay. Um, you know, so probably hatching out January, February, and then grown until spring. And I think they may be 40, 50. I'm not sure exactly what size they got stocked. And then they also kept some longer in the hatchery and released those out in the fall. Um, and those may also have really high survival. They just may not have returned yet for us to assess it. But at least in this very initial return amounts that they had <clears throat> this past fall of adults, I think most of them were from the spring. Okay, that's we'll interesting. To get yeah. verification on that, which is a little bit different, I think that, or could be, you know, we have an incomplete story, but. Um... Other questions out there for Alex? Is that eDNA work going to continue in terms of collecting the samples? Um, so yeah, not at the not at the moment. Um, but yeah, I think uh, we do have we have the equipment. So if there are future questions um, related to sampling depth, and I know we've discussed um, trying to quantify eDNA persistence, um, mm -hmm. we have the capability of doing that. And now we have the markers are developed through Fish and Wildlife Service. So. Um, but yeah, nothing set in stone now. And we do have um, that drifter survey from the fall. So um, hopefully we can yeah. provide some insight on uh, currents and thinking about potential for eDNA movement too. And I guess just going to your food web modeling, which is another sort of future work, uh, were lake trout affected at all by the collapse of the alewife? Um, was it like, I mean, we've seen Great Lake, Great Lakes Lake Trout be relatively generalist. I mean, they would consume alewife, but also gobies or smelt or bloater. Um, do you know Do you know much about the lake trout story in Keuka Lake now? Yeah, I'm beginning to go through that data, but I don't. Um, I can't comment on uh, you know kind of long term population 
uh, trends with lake trout. Um, we did do the lake wide uh, lake trout survey this summer, so we'll have that data soon. Um, and we did do stomach samples um, from those lake trout. We, at least from the sampled fish, um, uh, we did not have any lake trout with ciscos in them. Um, but they, yeah, it seemed like uh, mysis and uh, yellow perch from oh. the summer survey. Wow. Okay. But yeah, that's, I haven't uh, began to explore any of those data yet, but yeah, that'll be uh, the next part with this food web model is to also evaluate the um, lake trout. Yeah, very cool. And so Brad, like, do you... So this is Lars. Uh, you should actually have Webb talk about lake trout because lake trout in this lake has a natural reproduction and is very abundant. Uh, so it's an unusual lake trout population in the Finger Lakes that it's that one and Skinny Atlas Lake have survived. I think Skinny Atlas does natural reproduction too, but the other ones did not. So it's, uh, yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah, with, with so they were able to maintain natural reproduction even with alewife. Even I mean, with alewife. Alewife. alewife, yeah. It was one of those lakes we tried to understand why that is with looking yeah. at timing uh, amounts in the, in the alewife. And it was, we couldn't explain it. It seemed like there was time in Nace and the alewife in Cuca Lake, but they still survived. Yeah. Thanks, Lars. I guess Webster isn't going to jump on. Well, yeah, I can. Okay. But I mean, that's yeah. not much really to add from Lars. It is. Um, and Greg can correct me, but I think stock, it was stocked, you know, up until early 70s. Uh, then we stopped the lake trout uh, stocking because uh, naturally produced uh, reproduction seemed to be high enough. And now, um, you know, since the early 70s, it's been 100%, very high population. Um, they're almost, you know, people that they catch high, very high catch rates, um, using nothing really above 23, 24 inches. Um, just everything indicated a high lake trout population and the alewife population in the lake seemed high, um, but um, we, we've kind of lost our ability to really have a good handle on that. We used to put index nets out when we did our cold water assessment. And over the past 15 years, uh, the numbers just didn't really correlate to what we thought was going on. Mm. Um, unfortunately, since the collapse uh, of alewives, which also occurred back in the 60s uh, in this lake, um, we have, uh, with help of uh, Shuresh, uh, uh, implemented a uh, forge fish netting program. So, um, and, you know, don't quote me on the numbers, but um, when we did it, um, Cuca was like 3,000 fish per net, and most of the other finger lakes were up around 10 to 15, 20,000. Hmm. So the, the population of uh, forage fish in Cuca is definitely depressed. Hmm. Um, Alex mentioned smelt. Uh, smelt were there, but like most of the other Finger Lakes, uh, smelt have just been depressed probably since their mid 80s. Um, there's, it's hard to find smelt now, except in a few <clears throat> um, uh, Hemlock Lake and Owasco Lake, and the Finger Lakes are, have pretty good smelt population. Everything else has been depressed. and we think that has a lot to do with the zebra mussels that came in. Um, you know, the Clean Water Act back in 71, we're starting to see the effects of that now. Um, so, you know, pri our primary productivity in a lot of these lakes have dropped. Um, chlorophyll and cuca in the summer is anywhere from 0.7 to maybe 2.1. Hmm. So it's, it's pretty low water uh, productivity. Yeah, it's like Lake Michigan, Lake yeah. Huron. Yeah. Thanks, Webster. Yep. <clears throat> okay, I don't see any more hands up. You have a nice comment there from Colin uh, from Scotland. Um, very interested, especially in your eDNA stuff. So maybe you could follow up with him, Alex. Um, I think you can find him online somehow. I will follow up with you uh, to try to put you in contact with some of the Lake Huron folks just to see if there's any synergies that can develop there. Um, 
And before we close, uh, two things. One, reach out to me if you'd like to do this, uh, volunteer yourself for next month or the month after that. <clears throat> and then two, everybody, please just give a, 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 a virtual round of applause uh, to Alex for a great uh, seminar today. Have a great weekend, everybody. And uh, we'll see you next month. Thank you, everyone.